Hello again and welcome to the sequel to the first screencast where we're looking at a family of functions, a two parameter family of functions, f of x equals a times square root of b minus x squared, where a and b are positive. And we had done in the first screencast, we found the domain of this function, we found its critical values, and we found where the function is increasing and decreasing, and we found that every member of the family has a local maximum value uh, at x equals zero of value uh, a times square root of b. Now we want to move on to think about second derivative information. Namely, we're going to find the intervals where this function is concave up and where it's concave down. Once we've done that, we should be able to identify the inflection points very easily. This involves a fairly lengthy second derivative calculation. So if you want to see that, please hang on. <laughs> if you don't want to see that, just scan through to the end where you get through the result. Now to set this second derivative calculation up, I'm going to take the first derivative and just rewrite it slightly to make the derivative taking a little easier. So f prime of x, instead of writing it as a fraction with a root on the bottom, I'm going to write it as negative ax times b minus x squared, the quantity to the negative one half power. That's going to make derivative taking a little simpler. Now when I go to the second derivative of x, Again, a and b are constants, and particularly I have a multiplied constant right here in negative a. So the first order of business for me is I'm gonna pull out this uh, negative a and take the derivative of what's left over. So this is gonna be the derivative of x times the quantity b minus x squared to the negative one half. So just to strategize before we go over to the next page and begin, this is going to involve a product rule situation because I have two things multiplied together. And the second thing is going to involve the chain rule because it's a composite function. Like I said, this is a good recap of what you know about derivatives. So uh, watch onward if you want to see that. Okay, so let's proceed with the derivative here. The negative a is just hanging out here in front. It's a multiplied constant. So the first thing I need to do is use the product rule to take the derivative of x times the expression in the one-half power. So this is going to give me the derivative of x, which is one, times the second function, which is b minus x squared to the minus one-half, plus x times the derivative of b minus x squared to the minus one-half. That's gonna need the chain rule. So let me switch to a different color to indicate the chain rule portion of this. Uh, the chain rule, I would take negative one-half times the outer function to the negative three-halves power with the original inner function put into it times the derivative of the inner function. Remember, b is a constant, so it differentiates to zero, and the remaining derivative would be of negative x squared. That gives me minus 2x and close that outer parenthesis. Let's do a, quite a bit of cleaning up here to see what we can get done. Uh, one thing I see is that the negative one half times the negative two, both of those completely divide off. So, and the one, of course, multiplying by one uh, doesn't really do anything. So I have negative a times, let me write this all, uh, just the parenthesized portion here, b minus x squared to the minus one half plus Let's see, I have an x from here, and then everything else, there's another x down at the end, so that's actually x squared. And then I have this, uh, this expression here to the 3 halves. It's b minus x squared to the minus 3 halves. Now let's try to simplify this expression as much as possible. Um, it may not seem like a good idea, but it is actually gonna be helpful to take the negative powers here, the negative 1 half, and the negative three halves and turn those into fractions with roots on the bottom. So let's do that. Uh, negative a times, big parenthesis, b minus x squared to the minus one half is one over square root of b minus x squared, plus I have an x squared over uh, b minus x squared to the three halves. All right, there we go. Now if I multiply the a, the negative a through, Let's just do that real quickly. I would have negative a over square root of b minus x squared minus, or let me write it as this, plus negative ax squared over, uh, again, not really a root, but negative, or b minus x squared to the three halves. Now, what's gonna be helpful for us here is to get common denominators on these fractions to kind of put them together. So remember that I could just as easily, instead of writing a square root here, let me just erase that off, I could have very easily rewritten this as b minus x squared to the one half power. 
Now, what's the common denominator? Uh, the common denominator would be uh, b minus x squared to the 3 halves. Uh, and I would get the common denominators by taking this first fraction and multiplying the top and bottom by something. Let me scoot that equal sign over. If I multiply the top and bottom of this thing by b minus x squared to the first power, then that's just multiplying by 1. That doesn't change the fraction. But notice that's going to give me common denominators on the bottom because b minus x squared to the first times b minus x squared to the 1 half is b minus x squared to the 3 halves. So on the next page, I'm going to continue that calculation and we'll simplify this down completely. So let's carry out the multiplication step that you see here. On the top of the fraction on the left here, I'm going to have negative a times the quantity b minus x squared. And on the bottom, as we discussed, I'm going to have b minus x squared to the first times b minus x squared to the 1 half. That's b minus x squared to the 3 halves. Now in the second fraction, I have negative ax squared over b minus x squared to the 3 halves. Okay, so now we have common denominators. I can add the numerators. So multiplying this negative a uh, through the first set of parentheses gives me negative AB plus AX squared. Now this is all going to be over B minus X squared to the 3 halves. Now look at what I'm adding. I'm adding on a plus negative AX squared, adding the numerators. And so this is a really nice simplification. These two guys just simply subtract off from each other. And now here's my final answer. This is really worth the simplification step because it comes out to be nice and short. Negative AB over B minus X squared to the 3 halves. And that's your second derivative. That's a fairly lengthy calculation, obviously. But every step is just basic derivative techniques, carrying it out in algebra. Now, what were we supposed to do with this second derivative? We were supposed to use it to determine where the original family of functions was concave up and where it's concave down, and then try to find inflection points. Now, where is this function concave up? Well, a function is concave up whenever its second derivative is positive, and concave down wherever its second derivative is negative. So let's take a look at the second derivative expression here and just analyze its sign. Now, on the bottom of this fraction, in the denominator, I have a quantity raised to the 3 halves power. A quantity raised to the 3 halves power is always going to be positive uh, because 3 halves power means I'm cubing something and then taking a square root. A square root never outputs a negative result, and so that's always a positive number on the bottom. On the top, notice what happens here. I've got a times b. Now, at the very, very beginning of this problem, we said that a and b are both positive numbers, so a times b is always positive. Therefore, the numerator of this fraction, which is minus AB, is always negative. So no matter what the X is, no matter what the A is, no matter what the B is, in this function, the second derivative of my family is always negative, because I'm always taking a negative quantity divided by a positive quantity. So what this tells me is that F is always concave down always concave down. There's no value of x that makes f double prime positive. f double prime is always negative. So f is always concave down. Uh, therefore, um, there are no inflection points because an inflection point is where the concavity of f changes. It never changes, so no inflection points. So that's actually a fairly quick answer, although we had to do a lot of algebra work to get to it. So that pretty much fully specifies the uh, family of functions here in terms of critical values, increasing, decreasing behavior, concavity is very simple. As a parting shot here, let's go to GeoGebra and actually take a look at this family of functions and see if the behavior that we see actually fits with the calculations we made. So as you can see here in GeoGebra, I've plotted the family of functions here using sliders to change the parameters here. All the things that we calculated about this family turn out to be correct. As you can see, the domain of the function uh, goes from negative screw to b to positive screw to b. Here's the value of the screw to b right there, and you can see it does actually fit. As you change the b, the domain gets larger or smaller. Uh, the function is increasing from the left end of its domain up to zero, and then decreasing until we get to the right end of the domain. Notice that the critical value there is at x equals zero, and the local maximum value uh, is always equal to square root of a times b. You can change that either way. You can see the parameters do different things to this function, but some things always remain the same. Uh, we also see that the function is always concave down, sometimes increasing concave down, 
and decreasing concave down, but never concave up. So there's no inflection points on the graph of this function. And the great thing is we didn't need the visual to tell us this. We found it completely through our use of the calculation tools that we know. Thanks for watching.